Hi, my name is Gal Lawrence and thanks for tuning into my podcast today. If you're enjoying these conversations and you want to check out more of this transformational work, be sure to come back to guylawrence.com.au and join me as we go further down the rabbit hole. Enjoy the show. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. I've always wanted to visit Australia. <laughs> well, at least we're doing it virtually right now, which is not a yeah, bad thing. sadly. <laughs> yeah. Mate, um, I love to ask everyone on the show, if you were, say, at an intimate dinner party right now with a few strangers next to you, and they sat next to you and got chatting and asked you what you did for a living, what would you say? I'd say I was a psychic spy for the army. Wow. What we... <laughs> Well, you wouldn't mess, that's not messing around, is it? What, what, what reaction would you get? Um, first of all, people aren't sure they heard me right when I say that. I go, what? <laughs> you know, uh, and then, uh, then I, it gives me an opportunity to explain, right? Now, I say, well, I used to be a psychic spy for the Army. Um, now I teach people how to do it, right? So, and then I'll go into, I have this kind of elevator speech, right? I'll say, uh, the U.S. government, uh, had a program for 23 years during the Cold War where they took military personnel and government civilians and they trained them in this ESP-based skill, psychic-based skill called remote viewing. Essentially, they train us to project our consciousness to the other side of the planet, to inside hidden rooms, uh, forward and backward in time, using only the power of our mind alone. We were literally psychic spies for the military. And we spied on the Soviets or the Hezbollah or narco traffickers or whatever, whoever the bad guys might be. Uh, that was our job. And I did that for seven years. Wow. That's mind blowing. The psychic yeah. spy. I hadn't heard that expression. When, when we might as well dive in there. So, sure. so, okay. So there's a couple of directions I could go in this already, but the first one I would ask probably then is how would you define remote viewing for the listeners first, and then we'll go back into how the hell you got into becoming a psychic spy. Yeah, remote viewing is a skill that's based on an underlying everybody has, uh, underlying ability everybody has uh, to actually perceive things through essentially a form of extrasensory perception. Um, and it, it's used to purposely and directly gain information about a place, uh, a, a target event or a person that might be distant in time, might be shielded from perception in some way, like locked inside a room or hidden somehow, uh, or in fact, distance in, distant in, uh, in time, either into the future or into the past. Um, and it was developed in the military, in a, in a laboratory that was supporting the military, um, originally created by a, an artist in New York named Dingo Swan, uh, and then adopted by the CIA and later on by the Army. The Air Force used it for a while. The Defense Intelligence Agency, which is the intelligence organ for the military services, and ultimately given back to the CIA. Wow. And, okay, how, how are you seeing it or perceiving it then? So if, if you're remote viewing per se, I'm assuming you're not leaving your body or anything. Is it imagery that's coming in? Are we all connected or, or you, you even do that? You can leave your body. <laughs> I don't know. Like, well, it's, it, it's it, fascinating. It, we don't know the causality, right? We don't okay. have a causal story that explains this, which is one of the reasons the mainstream science wants to hold it off at arm's length is because we can't explain how it works. We have the data and there's some really strong data that shows us, it developed under really rigorous scientific circumstances. Okay. Strong data that shows that it's real. But how does it work? We don't actually know. Uh, we know where the stimulus is. We know what we perceive, but we don't know that story in between, right? So uh, when somebody says, well, you don't leave your body, I don't know. I mean, it isn't, that isn't what the experience is like. Um, my, my question oftentimes is, they say, well, how do you know you're in your body in the first place? <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so um, the experience is not like we're leaving our body in a particular way. It's like we actually do have some conscious connection to whatever the target might be. Um, and um, you do it and it works and you produce results. And, and the results can then be verified, measured against what the actual target was. And not all the time. It's not 100%, just like 
any perceptual experiences may have fallouts in it or dropouts in it. Okay. Uh, remote viewing can be really, really good. Sometimes it just falls flat. And since we don't know the mechanism for it, using mechanism very loosely here, so we don't know how it works or why it works. Let's put it that way. We don't know why it works. Um, you can't predict when it is going to work. There may be circumstances we don't understand or, or that we don't control for that keep it from working. And other times when it really does work, we've just done something right. Wow. How, how accurate can it be then? Like we're talking here. Well, sometimes it can be very accurate. Uh, there are a number of the kind of paradigm stories about remote viewing uh, cases that it turned out really well. So one was uh, when remote viewers at Fort Meade, as this happened largely at Fort Meade, Maryland, um, when they actually, 10 months before it was ever revealed, they successfully accurately described the Typhoon submarine before the Soviets ever launched it. And when the U.S. intelligence network didn't even really know it was there. Uh, that was really remarkable. Um, there's been others too, and maybe we'll talk about some of those as we go along. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's let's take us back then. How how does one become a psychic spy for the military? Like, what was well, this journey? Yeah, to become a psychic spy for the military, they have to actually have to come and recruit you. <laughs> okay. You can't. You couldn't. You could not seek it out and volunteer uh, because you only knew it existed if they decided to tell you. It. It existed and because it was what's called a special access program so you know there are literally millions of people in the military that have clearances have you know security clearances um, up secret up to top secret um, but you could have a security clearance and you would not be entitled to know about this uh, because there are compartments within the security world for projects that have to be protected so in this case what the only real defense against uh, a remote viewer is to take out the remote viewer. And so our program was really tightly compartmented so that no one would know who was in it. First of all, no one would knew that it exist, know that it existed in the first place. And second of all, they would never be able to find out who was involved in the program, mm -hmm. just partly for our own security sake. Um, so wow. essentially what happens is they would have to notice you and decide you were somebody they wanted in the program, and then they would approach you. You didn't go looking for it. Right? How, how would they determine the skill sets then? Because wouldn't they be like looking for the Michael Jordans of remote viewers to bring into the, into the team? Yes. And notoriously, the first day that Michael Jordan played basketball, knew, nobody knew he was going to be Michael Jordan, right? Right. He had to actually play and play and play until they discovered, hey, this guy's really good. Right. And in some way, they recognized that as a problem. Okay, So they knew that you don't know if something's going to be good until they actually try it. But there were some indicators that would suggest whether somebody would be a better choice than somebody else might be. Um, so they had certain criteria. For example, um, candidates for it would have to be well established in their military careers. And of course, we were all intelligence officers. So we're pretty limited to the intelligence branch in the military. So they had to be well established in their careers. They had to have good report cards that they were actually competent. Um, they had to be above average in intelligence, which presumably people in the intelligence world are above average in intelligence. I say presumably because that's not always the case, right? <laughs> but presumably. Um, and they were also looking for um, intelligence officers that had some kind of uh, creative pursuit. Okay. So for example, like they might be involved in studio art, like painting or drawing or something like that. Um, they may be musical performers in some sense. They may uh, be proficient in foreign languages, although there's a lot of language expertise in the intelligence world. Right. Um, so that's not quite as unu unusual. They might be creative writers or some other kind of creative person. And so, um, when they, they got to know me. So interesting, there's some synchronicity going on here. Uh, when I was assigned to Fort Meade, I was a Middle East uh, desk officer. I was a Middle East analyst. Okay. That was my job. But I moved in next door to Skip Atwater. Uh, he, back then we called him 
Fred Atwater, right? But he goes by Skip. Now we're moving next door to Skip Atwater, who is the, the training and operations officer for the remote viewing unit. And we are across the street from Tom McNair, who was at that time, unbeknownst to any of us, being trained as a remote viewer. And these guys, I was really curious, who are they? What are they? Is this really weird? Because they only wore civilian clothes, even though they were lived in military quarters that said Captain Atwater and Captain McNair, right? Uh, they only wore civilian clothes and Tom had a full beard. So that was very odd. And I had no idea what they did. And wow. I tried to find out and I, I didn't ever get any hint, although I could tell it was very strange because on Fort Meade, you generally knew what kind of intelligence work someone was doing. Okay. You may not know who, the, who they were doing it against, but you knew that they were either signals intelligence or imagery intelligence or human intelligence or something like that. And, you know, one of the ints as we called it. Uh, but these guys, I had no idea and they weren't talking. <laughs> I what, had, what year was this? This is 1983. 1983, okay. okay. 1983. So I move in next to these guys and we be became friends. They're really nice guys. And I didn't know, but they were assessing me because they were looking for three more recruits because they had a contract with the, uh, the think tank, Stanford Research Institute, now SRI International. They had a contract with the think tank that had developed this stuff um, to train through more people in remote viewing. I had never put the words remote and viewing together in one sentence, ever. I didn't, never thought about yeah. it, right? And most of the people in the universe at that time, or at least our, you know, human local universe had ever done that either. Um, so they're looking at me though, and they discovered that I had majored in art in college and had uh, illustrated books and liked to paint and stuff. They discovered I'd been playing guitar for 20 years. They discovered I was fluent in German and had been trained in Arabic and Hebrew. And they also noted that I liked to write short stories and send them off and get rejected <laughs> by the publishers, right? So th they had this thought, well, we can't not try this guy out. Right. <laughs> so so they uh, one day they came over and they said, hey, uh, we think you might be good at what we do. And I said, what do you do? And they said, we can't tell you. <laughs> I said, well, how do you know then? Or how do I know that I would be? I said, well, we're going to give you some tests. And they gave me some psychology tests and personality profile tests and things like that. Uh, and, uh, and I guess I scored where they thought I ought to. And there was a kind of a, a you know, set of boundaries within which they expected their best sources to fall. And apparently I scored in there. And so they, one day uh, they invite me over to their offices, which was only really a five minute walk from my front door, ironically. And I walk in and they sit me down in the back and Tom McNair with his beard and his pursuing clothes, he says, well, uh, first of all, sign this. I had to basically sign my life away. And not, it, was, it was a non-disclosure agreement that was even more arcane than anything I'd signed to get access to top secret information. I was really quite s surprised at how, how strict it was. And, uh, and then Tom says, okay, well, what we do here is we collect intelligence against uh, foreign threats using a parapsychology uh, skill known as remote viewing. We essentially want you to volunteer to become a psychic spy. Now, you don't have to tell me right now if you want to do it. You can think about it for 24 hours and come back tomorrow and tell me. I said, oh, no, I don't need that. Where do I sign? <laughs> I, and he was kind of surprised. He had expected me to be taken aback and that I would say, okay, well, I need that 24 hours to think about it. But I instantly knew that I wanted to do it. Because I was going to say, was there any um, <clears throat> skepticism coming up at the time thinking, shit, is, is this really going to work or can I do it? Or were you just like, no. Uh, so this, the, only, the skepticism was about me, not about whether it's real. Okay. Right? So so um, here's how that went. Um, as I was growing up, I liked science fiction. I particularly liked science fiction that involved extrasensory perception. I thought that was really cool, right? So I was reading all these fictional stories about ESP. And then come junior high, one of my classmates decided to do an ESP experiment. So that, you know, the one with the Zener cards, the, the wavy lines, the yes. star and all that stuff, right? And um, nobody got anything. I, I totally fell flat. Nothing psychic came out of that project at all. 
And so I thought, well, dang it. <laughs> I thought there was something to this and here I've totally failed. And it wasn't very scientific to make this conclusion, but I formed the conclusion, well, this, this must be a very fun thing in fiction, but there must be nothing to it in reality. And so at the time that I got this pitch from Tom, um, I was a bit of a mild skeptic. But here's how this that unfolded. Is as he's telling me this, my mind is thinking, he's telling me the government has a program that teaches people how to do this. That means there's a line item in the federal budget that pays for this. That means there's got to be something real to this. There is no way in heck I'm not going to try this out. <laughs> mm. So, you know, the, just the logic of it was very obvious at that point. There has to be something to this. Something that I've been excited about my whole life. There's no way. If, if they were going to give me the opportunity, I was going to accept it no matter what. Wow. I get, do you remember your first day, like when you turn up for the job and you think, right, I'm going to, I'm going to try well, this. The first day was mo no big deal because they just gave me a bunch of stuff to read. Right. So, okay. so I was reading books that some of them are like mind reach by Russell Targ and help put off and um, uh, journeys out of the body by Bob Monroe. Yeah. And I've read that uh, mind of mind by Rene Wacallier, you know, books like that. So that was my first thing is doing this background reading. Then it was time for my first remote viewing experience. That's where my skepticism came in about me. Okay, so I'm, I'm starting to believe this stuff is real, but it being real and me being able to do it are two different things. Hmm. Will I be able to do this? Will I fail? Will I, on the like the fourth day I was there, get kicked out of the program because I, I couldn't do it? And that was, of course, a real worry. It, was, it raised my anxiety level a bit. But, but they... I think they were used to people having that experience and feeling that way. And so they said, don't worry about it. We're just going to give it a try. Come on, you know, let's go do it. And so uh, what we did was what's called a, uh, an outbounder experiment. So what happens is you, the viewer, the remote viewer are in a room with another person and neither of you know what the target is. And these right. rooms windle us and they had, they were soundproofed and everything. Right. So we're in this room, we have no idea what the target is going to be. Meanwhile, a team of people, um, in this case, it was two people. Um, I want to say it was Tom and uh, it was Charlene. It was another person there. I don't remember. Um, it's written in one of my books. I have to look it up myself to remind myself, right? That's why I write books so I can remember these things. Right? Totally. So, <laughs> so uh, meanwhile, they were randomly assigned to target outside of any, any way I could hear, what, hear or see what they had been assigned. They were assigned to target and they went off to the target. Uh, about 15 minutes away drive. Um, and then I sit down there and Skip was my monitor and he guided me through. He said, okay, now what you do is you kind of write the start time on your paper and you, well, I'm sorry, this was, this was a, an ERV. So I was actually laying down when I did this. Okay. And he said, okay, so I want you to relax and focus and describe for me where Tom and Charlene are. Okay, so the idea is that you're not reading their minds. You're not seeing it through their eyes. You're just using them as the locational point. You find them, and then you find the target. Okay, so I described this, um, well, it's kind of a room. It's got uh, sort of beige off yellow walls. There's, um, the walls are kind of a matte, kind of a smooth, bumpy feel. There's windows with little curtains in them. There's these little spindly kind of tea table things with chairs. And then over here, there's a, a long feature with a transparent piece of assumedly glass in it with little things behind it. So I'm describing all this stuff and, and Skip is writing it down. He's recording what I'm saying and all this stuff. And, and we get done and Charlene and uh, Tom come back. And so then I get my feedback, which is they take me to the target. So we loaded, all loaded in the government car that we were assigned and we drove over the target. The target is this massive water tower, very blue color, central, uh, <laughs> central uh, a pillar. Uh, and then all of these legs coming down the things probably 50 feet tall and probably a hundred feet across. Nothing, totally nothing. I thought, oh crud, I really did fail my first time. I totally choked. They're gonna kick me out, you know, you know, so. We go back and we're eating donuts and stuff, you know, driving along eating donuts that they'd picked up and we're going along. And all of a sudden I saw off to the side, this little thing. And I said, 
what's that? And Skip, who had figured out what happened, said, it doesn't matter if you don't get the, he says, if you don't get the target, it doesn't matter what you get instead. And I said, I don't get it. And he said, okay, let's go over there. So we pulled in, got out, walked in this old building. So beige off yellow walls with flat bumpy feel to them, little lacy curtains in the window, these little spindly tea tables, a counter with glass in it, and behind the counter, rows and rows of donuts. So what had happened is Tom and Charlene had stopped at the donut shop on the way back and bought a bunch of donuts as a treat, which they should never have done because what I picked up was the donut shop <laughs> and not the water tower. So I learned wow. a very hard lesson that day. I learned that, oh, I really was psychic because I absolutely knew what I described, what I perceived was exactly what that was. It was it was just totally clear to me, but it wasn't what I was supposed to remote view. So I learned it doesn't matter what you remote view instead if you don't remote view the intended target. So yeah, right. it was both the confirmation and a hard lesson, you know, so. How, yeah, how, how clear is that information coming in then? Is it like vague, is it flashes or, or yeah. do you just sometimes it's clearer than our thought, you know, because yeah. it's. it's yeah, it, it, it can come in in various ways. So. Generally, when you start out in most of a, the first part of a remote viewing session, usually the impressions are, I call them vague, half-remembered memories. They are of that quality, like a memory you sort of vaguely recall, except it's something you, you know it's not a memory. So it's, it comes in, you get these impressions, and uh, over time you learn to identify ones that are real from ones that are imagination to some degree. You're never perfect at it, but to some degree. And so you can get colors... You can get qualities of light. In other words, is it bright? Is it dim? Is it shadowy? Okay. Is it whatever, right? Um, but it isn't just, even though it's called remote viewing, that's really probably the wrong name for it. It should have been called remote perception because you get visuals, but you also can get smells and tastes and tactiles mm. and everything. And sometimes those will come through almost as if you really are experiencing them. It's never the case that you really feel like you're touching something. But you can get the almost as if you are touching something. So uh, you may be rough or whatever, but sometimes you don't have that experience. What you have is just the sudden knowing, well, something here is rough hmm. without actually feeling a sensation of rough. Um, you might get an impression of red. Sometimes you actually get a vivid flash of red in your mind. Sometimes you don't get anything like that, but you just know that there's red here. And you just record all of that stuff. As you get deeper into a session, particularly when you're really on, you can actually start getting fairly accurate visual kinds of impressions. Again, you know you're not seeing these things. You just have this sort of visual experience of these. And, and those are probably rarer than the more vague kind of experience I've told you about. But they still happen fairly often to experienced remote viewers. Um, I've had that happen to me a number of times where it just popped right there there it was and it was right you know, wow. so. yeah amazing amazing because I've, I've had in my in my own meditation practices sometimes when i fully let go and and i know my body's uh just gone but i'm still conscious you know sometimes these extremely insane clear visions will just come in from something i got no idea what they mean why i'm seeing it or anything but it's there and it's like wow that's really fascinating you know and you know it's not your mind thinking it yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I am. Um, I'm curious that so once you've done your training in the military, you've been doing these things. When do they put you kind of like in the field per se? And then how many re remote viewing missions would you have done in that seven years that you you spent so, there doing it? Yeah. So um, this requires a little bit more of a complicated answer, right? Because first okay. of all, we start with training, right? We start with training. So the, the uh, experience I just told you about my first remote viewing experience, I did those a few more times during the next few months uh, because they were getting us ready to actually go out to California to Menlo Park where SRI is and start our, our formal training with Ingo Swan and with Hal Putoff, the folks who were you know, responsible for developing all of this stuff. They were under contract to the U.S. government to do all this. And so in January, we went out, we did our training, and we spent all of 1984 either going to New York, I'm sorry, either going to California or up to New York City. Um, we, there were two different training locations where 
before we went through our training process. And it, on average, it was two weeks we're away training and two weeks we're back home because they, they wanted to break it up a little bit so you have time to, as, as the technical terms, assimilate the, what you'd learned, right? right. So um, we did that for a year. And then um, we spent oh, roughly another year learning the more advanced stuff. Um, th it would have been much less time, except that we had a lot of, uh, of issues. They tried to shut the military unit down. The, the skeptics got in control of, of the decision-making and tried to cancel the program. And, um, and, you know, we had a lot of administrative crap we had to deal with during that time period. So in, we would have been done a lot sooner if it had not been for that. Um, so ultimately starting in about, uh, well, we did our first operational sessions in 1985, but the first serious ones we did starting in 1986. So it was about a two year period of, of building up to where we pay, became, as we say, operational, right. Become okay. real world problems. And then I, I was operational, uh, for, well, until I, I had to deploy to desert storm in 1990. So. So for over that four years, I probably did about a thousand a operational thousand. viewing sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And plus plenty of training ones as well. You know, so, wow. No, I'm sorry. Hundreds. Let's say hundreds. I think uh, a thousand would probably count for our training as well. Okay. So, but still, it's a, it's a lot. Yeah, still more a lot. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We would, uh, we would usually do a session every other day because by the time you when you get into the more advanced levels of this it's fairly grueling it's usually about an hour and a half or two hours of really focused and they didn't want us to get so hammered by this that we started bleeding over you know sessions bleeding into other sessions oh, okay, and stuff yeah. and they wanted to be very relaxed so interestingly in this setting we were the equipment we were the intelligence collection equipment right and so they didn't want us to overheat they didn't want us to blow any any valves or fuses, right? <laughs> to speak metaphorically here, and so um, and plus we had a lot of other standard military stuff to do. I was the security officer and the unit historian, and and the and the recruiting officer for new sources and training. We all had we had to perform training. Uh, so um, in 1984, at the end of 1984, SRI lost the contract because of all these skeptics coming in. And so we started doing in-house training of new people coming in. And so not only did we do our own work, but we had to teach the new folks how to do what we had learned how to do. So we had a pretty full plate in terms of the military and the training and then the operational stuff we did as well. So, Wow. And are there any um, view viewings that you were assigned to that really stand out where you think, oh, wow, we're going to do this? Or... <laughs> You know, and, and I don't know how much you can talk about it from being an expert. Most of it is actually now now declassified, most of it. Um, in fact, you can get access to a lot of these records on the CIA website. They've, they've, they've okay. published it all. The problem is, of course, it's just this huge, you know, they, they took a vacuum cleaner and sucked all the information out of the unit and then put it in the website, right? So most people don't know what they're looking at, really. Um if uh, anybody, there's there's an organization called, it's a nonprofit organization called the International Remote Viewing Association or IRVA for short. So at IRVA.org, people who join that organization can get access to a much more organized collection of the CIA Stargate archives, which they call it, program was called Stargate at the end. So you can get access to that. And I've actually written an introduction that kind of gives you a guide as to what's in there and people who join Irva can actually get access to all of that stuff. So if you're right. curious, okay. just, just, just don't join Irva. Um, and so uh, I forgot where, I, what question I was answering. What, 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 <laughs> uh, what's what, any particular one that really stood out for you? Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So um, yes, there are a number. Um, there was, um, you know, we, we actually were asked to remote view the U.S. stealth aircraft program because they knew the Russians had a, a, a remote viewing program and they wanted to know how vulnerable the really top secret stuff was to the Russians. 
But of course, you can't go ask the Russian remote viewers to remote view your, your stealth aircraft program and tell you how they did, right? That just wouldn't work. So they ask us instead to do it. Now, the thing, uh, I remember where I was going partly with this answer. One of the things you have to be aware of in remote viewing is that the viewer has to be blind to the target, okay? What that means is the viewer cannot know what the target is. Right. And the main reason for this is because if, if you, the viewer, do know what it is, then everything you can, you know about it already, everything you can guess about it, everything you infer about it, everything you speculate, all that stuff is right there live in your head. And it becomes a kind of a layer of noise that may block or, or at least contaminate the actual very subtle signal that's coming in. And it's the signal that has, has the information that they want. Right. So if all this other crap's going on, you lose the signal. So the viewers are intentionally kept blind to what the target is so that you didn't, didn't have all this competition for what they wanted to find out. Right. Um, it worked very well, except then people say, well, how do you know what the target is? <laughs> well, how do you know? <laughs> yeah, how do you do that? Well, so what appears to be happening is that our subconscious or our unconscious, what have you, the layers of, of thought well below our conscious awareness, uh, that seems to be connected in some way with the universe at large. Mm -hmm. And so um, we used to use, well, we still do, essentially use an arbitrary number to designate what the target is. So the example I always use is, we'll take a number 8675309, okay? You don't know that song, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up sometime. 8675309, okay? You'll get a kick out of it. Anyway, 8675309 equals, we'll say it's a training target, equals describe the Eiffel Tower, okay? So maybe I want my student to describe the Eiffel Tower as a practice target. So I'll write down 8675309 equals describe the Eiffel Tower, and I'll figuratively tear the sheet in half, and I'll keep the part that has Eiffel Tower on it, and I'll hand him or her the sheet that says 8675309. And then they'll take that number, they'll write it down, they'll go through the process they've been taught, and somehow the subconscious goes out of the universe, whatever that means, goes out of the universe, finds what that number is linked to, which is describe the Eiffel Tower, and then directs the viewer's conscious awareness to attempt to address that target, to access wow. that target, okay? And the conscious awareness actually doesn't know that it's going to the Eiffel Tower, right? It only knows it's going to start perceiving stuff. And it comes in very vaguely at first, as I mentioned. And usually it starts off with the sensory elements, like it's hard, it's cold, it's metallic, black, and with some dimensionals, it's tall, it's airy, crisscrossing elements and that kind of thing. You may start sketching it. And then later in the session, you'll start getting things like... Uh, commemorative, foreign, touristy, tourists come to visit this place. It's set in a, in an urban, it's in an urban setting. Some, for some reason, I'm thinking about France, you know, you get that kind of stuff in later on in the session. Um, and ultimately, um, the, the, the most advanced stage we call stage six, you can actually build a model of the target that you have um, mm -hmm. out of, clay or other materials. Uh, Three-dimensional modeling is a, is a part of the process. Now, you'll be, have been remote viewing for about 90 minutes or two hours before you get to the point where you might build a model. But uh, if you've seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I did. As a, I loved that as a kid. So Richard yeah. Drives is building Devil's Tower out of mashed potatoes yes. on his dining room table. That's stage six controlled remote viewing. Right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. I am, um, you know, it, it's, it's, Fascinating what you say. I'm assuming then intention is a big part of mm -hmm. it's remote key. viewing. It's, it's a key, key element to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why is that? What, so what is, why did, what, what do you think of working with intention? Because I'm always fascinated with intention because we live so unconsciously. We I never really think about this. Okay. Is there anything in the human world that doesn't center on intention? I guess not. We do say oftentimes, well, 
I did that unintentionally. Well, that's pretty much a lie, <laughs> right? It, we, we may not think that we, we purposely did something, but you have to have some kind of intention to take an action of any kind. You even have to have some kind of intention to not take an action of any kind. Okay. So, and except, and in a way, even when you're asleep, there's some inten intentionality going on. Our dreams involve intentional states. Mm. All right. So, so I don't know, maybe, maybe you could come up with something, but generally speaking, our whole world revolves around intentionality in some form or other. Uh, and so it's not a surprise that intentionality is an important element in remote viewing as well. Yeah. Are the, are the military still doing this or looking at this or using this? Do you know? Um, probably not. Okay. Uh, people say, well, how can that be? I mean, look at all the successes you had. Yeah, we had a lot of successes. We had a lot of failures, you know. And on top of that, I mean, that's true of any intelligence collection modality. Uh, satellite imagery isn't perfect. Make a lot of false decisions or fail to make decisions based on satellite imagery that is incomplete or incorrect. You can have incorrect satellite imagery. People don't right. realize that. Um, signals intelligence. There's a lot of, there's ways of fooling it. And I can't, I don't know what I can get into here because it's, it's a very checkered classified kind of a field, right? But there's ways you can fool signals intelligence. There's a way you can be misled, mislead yourself with signals intelligence. Uh, same thing applies to human intelligence. I mean, you never know if the agent that you're getting your information from is a double agent or not, right? <laughs> so, yeah. so all of the intelligence modalities, modalities have their false positives and their false negatives. Remote viewing is just like that, but it has the added problem in that it is something that's very controversial. It's something that people either believe in or don't believe in. Nobody questions that you can get a radio intercept using signals intelligence. There's nobody who argues against that, but saying I can perceive something in, in the former Soviet Union in a bunker out on in, in north of the Urals or something. Yeah. That's something that people are find easy to reject if it's not in their belief structure. So that's the additional thing. So what happened was um, we had some successes, we had some failures, but the big issue was that people didn't believe in it or they're scared of it or they don't want anything to do with it. And so ultimately what happened was the people who were our supporters either retired or died um, and that left people who are detractors and skeptics and critics behind in decision-making positions. So when Congress decided the DIA wasn't doing a decent job of managing remote viewing, they decided to pass it along to the, to the CIA, to the Central Intelligence Agency. But there was some miscalculation there because it turns out that the director of the CIA, John Deutsch, was a notorious remote viewing skeptic. <laughs> he was, he's on record as having kicked people out of his office who even brought up the, the subject when they were supposed to come and give him briefings and stuff. So um, they were essentially, Congress gave the project to, a, to a, uh, an organization that was led by someone who didn't believe in remote viewing and didn't want to have anything to do with it. Mm. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that the CIA canceled it. Uh, people will... Um, You'll hear a lot of folks who've read the news stories on it and say, well, the CIA found that it didn't work. Uh, it shouldn't be surprised, but that's a lie. They did not find that it didn't work. What they did was they commissioned a report that purported to find that it didn't work, that reported that it didn't work, having not actually done any serious research on it. Uh, the telling thing here is that the CIA closed down the program, the remote viewing program, the day that it received it from DIA. So June 30th, 1995 was the transfer date. The CIA accepted the program on that day and then locked the doors and sent everybody home. They shut the program down the very day that they accepted it, wow. which made Congress mad, but by then it was too late. <laughs> so, and then the report that everybody gets that all is of no use. Um, yeah. <clears throat> thought from. That report wasn't, the research for that wasn't even started until the month after they shut the program down. Hmm. So the report that was supposed to justify shutting the program down was started after they had shut the program down. Right. Now what does that tell you? Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you one, another soundbite on that report. Um, in the course of the report, uh, at Fort Meade, well, not just Fort Meade, but in the course of the remote viewing program, we probably did close to 3,000 or so. I don't know exactly. It's hard to nail it down. Operational remote viewing sessions on 
several hundred remote viewing or uh, yeah, remote viewing intelligence collection projects. The report only considered 40. So less than 1% of the total they considered and they based their conclusion that it was not useful from an intelligence perspective on 40 of multi-thousands wow. of missions. Yeah, fascinating. It is fascinating because I, I, I've said it before, but I, I'm in my little podcast bubble, right? You know, having these conversations all the time. And I've had some very acclaimed scientists on here as well that talk about a field of energy that's given rise to to consciousness and giving rise to our reality right now. I had Professor Donald Hoffman on here, who's created the theorem that nobody has been able to prove him wrong. And um, yeah, he's a good guy. I, I, I like him. He's yeah, right. You're for yeah. aware of his work, yeah. right? He's I disagree guy. with him, but I like him. <laughs> okay, but it, it's it's fascinating. And I, I had Greg Braden on you. You know, he talks about the divine matrix and the yeah. field of information as well. I'm curious to know your point of view. What do you think is going on with it all from your experience? Well, there's this, this cartoon I saw a long time ago, which shows um, Einstein working out one of his theories, right? And there's all of these complex mathematical symbols and stuff. And then there's the conclusion over here and there's this gap in the middle and he writes, and then a miracle happens. <laughs> right. <laughs> so in between is a miracle, right? And, and if I was forced to say what I know, that's what I'd have to say. I know this side of it. I know this side of it. I have no idea what fits in the middle. Yeah, okay. fair enough. And no, neither does anybody else. There's yes. lots of theories. There's well, not even theories. There's lots of hypotheses. There's lots of speculation, but nobody actually knows, right? So that would be the bottom line. Now, what do I think is going on? First of all, I don't think that what happens in remote viewing is physical. I think it's a non-physical aspect of the universe. Now, maybe consciousness is that. It may be that consciousness is a essentially a co-primitive with matter. So you have matter and then you have consciousness. Now in, in mainstream science, it's driven by this uh, metaphysical doctrine known as physicalism. So physicalism says that uh, everything in the universe is either physical or the consequence of physical facts. Okay. That's all there is, is physical. Uh, now, you know, physical can be energy or matter, or whatever, but nonetheless, it's all physical and there's nothing else. And, and it is a metaphysical claim. They cannot prove that that is true. There's literally no way to prove it is true without assessing everything in the universe, which of course we can't do. Hmm. There's no way for us here on this little tiny planet out there in the arm of one galaxy of billions to be able to, to research the entire universe, right? So, so uh, the most that a physicalist can actually substantiate is it's probably true that Physic, you know, physical things and physical forces are the only things that exist. But there's this counterexample called extrasensory perception, which maybe in the end they'll prove it's physical, but right now there seems to be no way that it could fit within a physical paradigm, aside from the speculations and hypotheses that people like to throw out. And so I think that there are non physical elements in the universe and that remote viewing works by virtue of that or mm -hmm. those, whatever it is. Um, what is that? I can't tell you. I'm in the physical world right now. I can't tell you what that is. But I know the way it behaves suggests very strongly that there is more to the universe than just the physical part of it. Got it. Yeah, fair enough. You, you, you teach this. You run courses. You run, I think, week-long retreats and everything. Mm -hmm. What... Um, what kind of people come to learn and why are they coming to learn it? Like, what have you seen? What's the, what's the driving force behind that? So it's hard to say what kind of people. Um, the one thing that they are is, I won't say open-minded because some people come here who aren't open-minded at all. They've formed their own opinions right. about what the universe is. Um, I have had, I, I, I can't really nail it down to one because I've had dog trainer and a flower ranger I've had the CEO of a major aerospace company. Mm. I've had numerous PhD psychologists. I've had act, serving active duty military folks. I've had housewives. I've had teachers. I had a school principal. I have people from every walk in life. 
I've had a truck driver, a UPS truck driver, right? On his way through, stop for a week. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, just have people from walking life. The one thing they share in common is they're curious. Some of them don't really believe this is going to work, but they want to give it a chance. It's kind of an expensive experiment because of my teaching model. It's not, it's not cheap for most right. people. But still, um, it's a by far the most come uh, probably because it's kind of a self-actualization thing. They're trying to, to determine for themselves whether or not this proposition is true, that we are more than our physical bodies. Mm. And uh, I, I use the comparison of, of uh, skydiving. So you can use parachutes for lots of things, get military forces behind enemy lines, put in smoke jumpers, put out, you know, to work on forest fires. Um, uh, to get supplies in or, or paramedics or whatever, right? But the vast majority of people who do it as civilians do it just to prove to themselves they can do it, just to do something that the rest of the world, they know the re most people on average are scared to do. Oh, yeah. They're essentially yeah. overcoming themselves and they're trying to transcend their limitations. And I'd say that's probably a good metaphor for why people come to learn remote viewing is to prove to themselves that we really are more than our physical bodies, that our consciousness is conscious, whatever is plural, singular, I don't know. Our consciousness does extend beyond the limits of our skulls. Um, and it's really awesome to watch them because you'll, you'll see somebody down at the end of the table and you give them a target and they know exactly what they know about it to start with, which is nothing. And they go through and they sketch and they verbalize and they experience, and they get it all down there. And they're still not sure they got it, but they feel like they've accomplished something. And then they see their feedback and realize, I really did describe the Eiffel Tower and I had no idea it was the Eiffel Tower. And I had no way of knowing it was the Eiffel Tower except through the power of my own mind. And that's just a, a real epiphany for a lot of folks. They go, holy cow, this stuff really does work. And the implications of that are huge for human, for human nature, absolutely huge, both for human nature large and for our individual human natures. Wow. I would imagine it would lean into starting to believe and trust in yourself more and, and lean into your own intuition as well. I, th I think probably you I think, do. I mean, you still yeah. have doubts and all that kind of stuff, but generally speaking, you, you at least have more respect for yourself. You realize, mm. Oh, there's more to me than I could imagine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Can anyone learn this? Well, yes. Um, although that's qualified, yes. Uh, obviously, okay. there's going to be some people who can't. You know, someone who may be really far on the autistic spectrum may have trouble. Although maybe they'll succeed. I don't know. It'd be an interesting experiment if they. But how do you get? You know, if if they would be willing to, to try that. Uh, but there are people who who they're um, they may have cognitive issues that make it hard. Um, there are also though maybe people who are so biased against that they won't succeed. You have to be be willing to at least let go and give it a try. You don't have to be non-skeptical. They've had actually uh, skeptics go to SRI and say, no, nah, this doesn't work. And then it does, and it blows their minds, right? But if you are too hard over as a skeptic, you're going to deny everything. Uh, right. Deny okay. Everything. So, yeah, yeah. No, fair uh, enough. Even if you have success, you're going to deny it, right? Yeah. So if somebody's listening to this right now, when, when, when it's aired and they're inspired and they thought, right, I got to give this a crack. I want to start or somewhere due to the global <laughs> restrictions that are going on and maybe they can't join you for a week or whatever. How could they start to experiment? Do you have any simple resources for them or? Yes. Um, and in fact, I'll refer them to a video that I have and okay. uh, maybe you can post the link later, but you can find it on YouTube. Um, it's called, uh, let's see, how do I call it? It's called how to do a simple remote viewing. If you look for how to do a simple remote viewing, uh, you'll find it. And uh, that will actually talk you through a very easy kind of experiment of how you could try remote viewing for yourself. Um, kind of a partner video to that is um, called uh, Remote Viewing Martial Art for the Mind. Well, that's an in introductory video that to tells you what it is. And then how to do a simple remote viewing tells you how to do it, at least at a basic level level very fundamental level Be beautiful i'll make sure for everyone listening to this there'll be show notes below and if you pause uh there'll be a link 
in the show notes to that video as well for everyone yeah. to start out with. And of course, if they want to go deeper, you got books, you got, like you said, yeah. longer stuff. So for, for the beginner, let me recommend my second book as well. It's called uh, The Essential Guide to Remote Viewing. Yeah. Okay. This says my internet connection is unstable. Can you still hear and see? Yeah, me? no, it's all good. It's all good. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's referring to the person on the internet is unstable. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the book's called The Essential Guide to Remote Viewing. And it also has a couple of chapters on how to do basic remote viewing. Um, plus a lot of other things. It tries to answer any question that someone new to the field might have. So. Yeah, amazing. And I, I got one last question for you before we wrap up the the show and I ask everyone on the show, Paul, and that is with everything we've covered today, is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners to ponder on? You should have told me earlier and then I would have had an answer. Does anything to have them ponder on? Um, well, I guess it ties in with what I was just talking about a few minutes ago. And that is think about what it would actually mean if you were to discover that you could indeed perceive things on the other side of the planet without any, what we might refer to as normal connection whatsoever, no sensory connection. You don't, can't see, smell, hear, feel it. Uh, and no technical connection, no closed circuit TV, no, no satellite uh, broadcast, anything like that, just something on the other side of the planet. Think what that would mean about you, what that would say about you as a person, that you could do something like that. And then extend that to everybody on the planet. What does that say about the human race in general, about what we, how little we expect from the human race, how much we should perhaps expect from them? Mm. Beautiful. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more, mate. I, um, I'll make sure um, the, your link to your website is below as well. But the best place, because you've got a couple of websites, I'm, I'm, I think, don't you? Or, well, the, you my got, main one is rviewer.com. So the letter R and the word viewer. So R-V-I-E-W-E-R.com. That, that's everything. Everything is there somewhere if you can find it. Now, the beauty of that website is there's a lot of stuff on there for free, right? So you can... You can uh, go up to where it says remote viewing in depth. And there's a lot of information about remote viewing there just in general, um, which you don't have to pay anything for. There's no membership fee or anything like that. Um, for people, so, so of course I want to endorse my website, so, but, but I'm also, uh, I'm also uh, affiliated with two other organizations, the Parapsychology Association, three other organizations, the Parapsychology Association, the Rhine Research Center and the International Remote Viewing Association. All of these are nonprofit organizations that are trying to push the envelope forward on all of this stuff, extrasensory perception, remote viewing, all of that. And all of them are worthy organizations. The Remote Viewing Association has a, an annual conference where in the not, when it's not COVID time, right? Uh, people from all over the world come together and talk about remote viewing and experience it. Um, the Rhine Research Center is actually the oldest parapsychology research, the oldest scientific parapsychology research organization in the United States. I think the American Society of Psychical Research might be a little older, but there it was founded by J.B. Rhine, who is the father of modern parapsychology research. Um, and the Parapsychology Association is the main uh, is kind of the the premier organization that re, uh, the, of researchers in the field. All of them are really valuable, so I'd love to give them a shout out as I just did. So totally, we'll make sure they they're in the show notes as well for everyone. So there's plenty for them for everyone to dive deep if they want to check this yes. oh, fantastic yeah. workout. Keep um, you busy. <laughs> totally, Paul. I just want to really say thank you and I deeply appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing your experience and your expertise with this work and. Um, and yeah, who knows whether what uh, who this will inspire. So much appreciated. Thank you, Paul. You are quite welcome. I was happy to be on it. Maybe sometime in the future we can do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, buddy. You bet.